I'm Eric Becker, conservation engineer. Who here knows WWF or what WWF is? Nobody. It's up for you. Good. Yep, exactly. I am a professional wrestler, in case you were wondering. <laughs> so before we get started with the talk, I'd like to just play a quick inspirational video that kind of touches on some of, some of the many things WWF does around the world. And then we'll get into some serious topics. So again, that just kind of touches on some of the many things we do around the world. Um, WWF is the leading organization trying to protect uh, wild places and wild species and reduce the human footprint on our planet. Uh, we've been around for over 50 years, working in over 100 countries, and we have uh, over 6 million members worldwide. <clears throat> so today's talk is going to be about wildlife crime, I mean, the issues, and how we can use technology to try and combat, and combat it to, to protect these uh, beautiful animals and these amazing parks. So just to give you a little background about myself, I'm obviously an extreme nerd. Uh, I was born on Edwards Air Force Base in California where the uh, US Air Force developed a lot of the aviation breakthroughs. That's where they broke the sound barrier and d came up with stealth technology. Uh, my grandfather worked for Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, where he w uh, worked on the SR-71 program and the U-2 spy program, or spy plane program, which really inspired me uh, to live a life creating amazing things. I mean, I grew up seeing all these amazing machines that man can create. So this is a, a picture of my man cave, as I, I like to call it. Uh, the 3D printer, my wife calls my mistress, because when it's printing things, she says I don't look at her the same way I look at the printer, which, I'm sorry, this thing can make things for me. Um, so I started off uh, my kind of engineering career doing UAV research and development, uh, mostly on micro air vehicles, so drones that are under a foot, under a pound. Uh, this was kind of before the consumer drone market skyrocketed, so back then we were trying to make these things fly autonomously, and nowadays you can buy a $200 drone that's just way beyond what we were developing. Um, after doing UAVs for a little while, I ended up uh, working with some ex-Special Forces guys where we developed uh, self-driving cars, not, again, not as cool as the ones you guys are developing and showing off at the show, and then uh, ultimately would drive these uh, old Jeep Grand Cherokees as ground targets so the Special Forces could practice calling in airstrikes on it. Um, so a lot of <coughs> being exposed to all this military technology really, I mean, showed me what you could do with uh, sensors technology. I mean, how you can have these intelligent sensors out in the field that can tell you what's in front of them. Um, but a lot of that technology was uh, outrageously expensive. So, <coughs> my <coughs> in 2014, I was approached by my old UAV boss, the guy that hired me out of college, uh, and he had gotten a contract from WWF to do a pilot uh, anti-poaching drone project in Namibia. So instantly I jumped on the opportunity and uh, attended at a meeting, uh, listened to all their issues and their cause, and came away really inspired. So I just started uh, volunteering my time, trying to design anything and everything that they needed, which ended up turning into a consulting gig and then ultimately a full-time position as conservation engineer, which is a little unique because I, I think I was, I'm one of the only engineers that works in-house at an NGO where I focus on trying to develop technology to protect wildlife. 
I have to be the luckiest engineer in the world. I get to travel to these exotic places and play with baby rhinos and baby elephants, and it's just absolutely amazing seeing these creatures in the wild. I mean, if you've seen them in a zoo, I mean, that's great. It's really good for education, but if you ever have the opportunity to travel to these places, it's, it, it's absolutely worth it. I mean, pictures and videos do not do it justice. So at WWF, um, Again, I'm the, an engineer for the, uh, an NGO where I get to be on the ranger side, where typically they, <coughs> in the past, would be, or receive a lot of sales pitches, people trying to sell products to them because they see it as a business case. So now I can act as the first line or the filter and make sure that they, before they invest in any technology, that it really does what it says. <coughs> I also work uh, with the rangers on the ground to, so I can understand their challenges. Uh, so I'll embed myself with them, go out on ambush missions, go on uh, foot patrols so I can see firsthand their challenges and what they're going through day, <laughs> every day. So I, before we jump into how we use technology to try and catch poachers or uh, stop wildlife crime, we'd like to just touch on wildlife crime. <clears throat> Over the past years, we've seen a rampant spike in wildlife crime. Um, which devastates species, devastates ecosystems, and uh, also, I mean, <laughs> harms the local communities, I mean, their security and their livelihood. And I'm going to show you guys a quick little video that describes wildlife crime, and I'm going to go ahead and warn you, it's a, a little gruesome, but I can't do a talk about wildlife crime without showing you the reality of what's going on on the ground. And there's the warning again. We have to look at it for what it is. It's, it's organized crime on a very massive scale. It involves not just the, the wildlife at stake, but the people, the economies, um, and whole regions of the world. Many are surprised to learn that illegal wildlife trade is one of the largest criminal activities in the world. In fact, it ranks among the world's top illegal trades. On the scale of illegal black markets, you know, the usual sorts of things like drugs and human trafficking, wildlife sits at the top five. The value of the black market for illegal wildlife is estimated to be between seven and $10 billion annually. The amount of money that is made by illegal wildlife trade is enormous. I mean, this is not one individual or a few individuals going around killing a few animals, as bad as that would be, and that would be bad. But it is wholesale slaughter of animals. who conduct, who finance wildlife trade and who are making the big money from it are some of the same people who are involved in the trade in drugs, guns, human trafficking. Also, some of that money is finding its way into the hands of uh, recognized Islamist terrorist organizations that's supporting insurgency. These dangerous organized criminal elements are not just endangering wildlife and worldwide national and regional security. They are also directly threatening the lives of people in the regions in which they operate. You have another type of a poacher, which is quite dangerous now. So they will come in armed uh, looking for a rhino specifically. They normally come in uh, with, obviously they come in with rifles. Um, your AKs. The 
challenges rangers are facing these days in the field to combat poaching is immense. You're up against criminal gangs who are armed with high-powered rifles. They're armed with night vision scopes, which means they can effectively use the daytime and the nighttime. And the rangers are not fully equipped to their standards. We're talking about automatic weapons. We're talking about vehicles on which weapons, heavy weapons are, are mounted. Uh, we're talking about rocket-propelled grenades, basically war-fighting equipment. We are seeing poachers being former soldiers who are trained in actual combat. And this is not a skill normally imparted upon the rangers under ordinary conservation circumstances. So the challenges they are faced is very high. So it's a problem that not only, not only affects the species in the natural world, it, it threatens local communities, which in turn then threatens economies at local and national levels. The kingpins of the wildlife trade feel confident they can continue this violent, destabilizing activity with impunity due to weakly enforced national and international regulations, lack of effective prosecutions, and low penalties. This makes wildlife crime a low-risk, yet high-profit crime. There are laws on the books in a lot of places. They're not getting enforced well. In some places, the laws are not strong enough and they need to be improved. In some places, the laws are strong and countries are trying to enforce them, but the issue is not a high-level political uh, priority, and so they're not getting the support they need politically within their countries to prosecute the crimes. The, the traders, the legal traders, the criminals. They know the loopholes within the law. They know how to circumvent the law to operate the way they're operating. It's enormously destabilizing because these people bribe judges, they bribe border guards, they in some cases bribe rangers, in other cases they bribe villagers to let them camp out in these areas. They, in effect, take a slice of a country, a portion of a country, and make it ungovernable for the government of that country. They can't, they don't, they lose control over it. They lose control over their judiciary, lose control over their borders, lose control over their police system because they're bribed. Or if they're not bribed, they're intimidated. So it, it, it undermines the governance process in a lot of countries who are struggling themselves to govern and now they have this additional destabilizing factor. Wildlife crime and the threats and instability it brings is only escalating each year as these criminal activities continue unchecked. To stop this, every country needs to treat wildlife trafficking like the serious crime it is. And we need this to happen fast before the situation gets far worse. You can help us make that happen. So again, sorry for the, the gruesome images, but I mean, you really need to understand what's going on on the ground. <clears throat> In the past 10 years, uh, we've lost over 20% of the African elephants, uh, mostly due to poaching for their ivory. Um, <clears throat> we also, I mean, over 1,100 rhinos were killed in 2015 in South Africa <clears throat> alone, compared to just 13 in 2007. I mean, which is just astronomical. In some cultures, it's believed that uh, rhino horn can cure cancer or cure some diseases, cure hangovers, or be, I mean, make you stronger in bed at night. That's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, there's <clears throat> no data showing that there's any medicinal properties in rhino horn. Actually, the, the studies that have been done shown that it's uh, actually made out of keratin, which is the same uh, material your, your fingernails and toenails are made out of. So if you're ever interested, and exploring the medicinal properties of rhino horn, just go ahead and grind up your fingernails and snort it and you'll save a lot of money. <clears throat> I mean, it's the same logic as if you think eating Smarties or drinking smart water will make you smarter. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. So 
again, the rangers, when you think of park rangers, especially in the U.S., you think of guys that are conserving the wildlife, uh, maybe protecting the tourists or uh, educating people. But what we're, having to, or what we're seeing in Africa due to this spike in uh, poaching is the, the rangers have to be trained in combat tactics. They have to start carrying around assault rifles, <clears throat> which, again, is not a, a skill set that you would expect these rangers to have. It's easy for me to stand up here and talk about the anti-poaching work we're doing uh, and the, the great stuff the rangers are doing, but these guys are the ones risking their life every day, going out, leaving their families, and not knowing if they're going to come back the next day. So <clears throat> now that we're past the, the gruesome stuff, um, I work on the, the better protection side, the site-based security. WWF attacks the problem from all different angles, and as you saw, closing the markets. Uh, start lowering demand um, and also finding the routes, uh, the way the, the ivory or the rhino horns getting out of the countries. So in 2013, we received a $5 million global impact award from Google.org to come up with an umbrella of technology to uh, protect wildlife from wildlife crime. Since I joined the project in 2014, we've really focused on uh, trying to identify technologies that will work in the African environment. When you and actually, with my military background, I, the first technologies I looked at were all the military sensors and, I mean, systems, which first are too expensive for parks. I mean, these parks have very limited funding and limited manpower. Um, but after filtering through the military stuff, uh, most of the sensors relied on another layer of cameras. And since all poaching happens at night, we obviously need some, sort, some form of night vision which is where the thermal cameras came, in, uh, came into play because they're long-range sensors. They pick up on body heat, which is easy for uh, image processing or video analytics to uh, discriminate the, the human or the animal from the background. So, I mean, under the, the Google grant, we've uh, looked at seismic, acoustic, radar, LIDAR, I mean, ways to use UAVs, how do we make drones more effective. Um, actually, the, uh, the initial focus for the grant was, or was supposed to be on how UAVs can stop poaching, and they were supposed to be the silver bullet, which is just not realistic. And we did a study where if you have a UAV flying along a park boundary, you have a high probability of detecting uh, an intrusion if you're only monitoring one kilometer, but as soon as you go beyond that, the prob or probability of detection goes down to zero, so it's just not realistic. So we need to come up with uh, low-cost sensors or deploy other uh, ground sensors that can give us the granularity of the intelligence, so then we could de deploy the rangers or de deploy the UAV. Most of these parks are the size of counties or the size of states. Uh, to give you an example, I'm working at a, a park in Zambia that's uh, larger than Massachusetts, and they have 100 rangers to protect this park. So technology has a place to play in conservation. And actually, the Internet of Things is really exciting for us because in the past, we were very, relied on uh, industry to develop uh, sensors, and there wasn't really a focus on the mobile computing, the intelligence at the edge, or the low-power, long-range sensors, which is kind of the, what we're seeing with uh, coming, are coming out with the, the Internet of Things. So we're really excited that industry is kind of merging with our requirements. So again, when these parks are vast, uh, all poaching happens at night, <clears throat> they're limited manpower, so you want to deploy sensors that aren't going to cry woof or be inundated by false alarms. So, and then also, you don't want to have a visual impact, so you, or, and you don't want to <laughs> take away from uh, the rangers' day-to-day -day operations and have them maintain thousands and thousands of sensors um, to try and protect their parks. So we really need things that uh, are, again, intelligent and long-range enough uh, so we don't have to deploy so many, so many systems. This is actually a picture of the uh, world-famous Maasai Mara Reserve. If you've ever seen video of uh, wildebeest crossing a river and getting eaten by crocodiles, that's at, this, that's at this park. And it's actually where the world's largest land migration happens. And if you ever have a chance to go to Africa, I highly recommend this location. So, I mean, many of the challenges in Africa, there's no connectivity, no power. Um, so we basically have to bring all our infrastructure. And this uh, kind of is another challenge that when I first started working in Africa, I didn't really think of. I mean, was, I, how, what are the animals, the curious animals, when you put something in, in their environment, they're obviously going to want to mess with it. 
And this uh, is a picture of one of our thermal cameras or one of the systems we deployed in Kenya. And a baboon thought it would be a good idea to jump up and down on our solar panel. So the Kenyans actually came up with a pretty ingenious uh, game proofing method and they just lubed the poles. And if you see, you can kind of see the scratch marks where the baboons were trying to cr climb up onto the box. <clears throat> I wish I had some of this video because it's hilarious. I mean, you just see these baboons jumping on a pole, sliding, and they just do it. I mean, they'll do it for hours. So, <clears throat> Catching poachers with thermal cameras. Again, after looking all, at all the sensors, working with the rangers on the ground, um, you quickly, or I quickly realized that they have no night vision capability. I mean, they can't, they're supposed to work at night. Uh, their their high-tech method for catching poachers was a, a flashlight and a radio, which was just completely ridiculous uh, and, and, and unsafe. I mean, you may be able to spot somebody 10 meters, 20 meters away with a flashlight. And at that time, it's too late. Um, and historically, before, night, before we uh, started piloting thermal cameras, the rangers would sit, wait, and listen, and just hope poachers would walk up on them, or they would go on a random foot patrol. And again, in a park the size of the state, the chances of walking onto a poacher are highly unlikely. So this is uh, an image of uh, some of the uh, thermal cameras we were testing for the fixed kind of perimeter intrusion detection systems. Uh, we had a little machine learning algorithm that you could train to classify and warn you on uh, whatever you cared about. So we would collect some ground truth, and eventually the system would automatically or autonomously warn us whenever something crossed a digital trip line or came into a park. The other beauty of using thermal cameras is you can actually see if a guy's armed, which helps you, I mean, plan how you're going to respond and, I mean, how heavy you need to come in so you can safely apprehend the suspects. So this video is uh, a day in the life of Eric Becker in the office. This is what I get to do for a living. So in the <clears throat> end of August last year, I went uh, out on an ambush mission with the Rangers at the Bar Conservancy. And as you can see, I mean, the, the high beams on the, the vehicles and the flashlights were the typical way they would find poachers. And I mean, these places, I mean, they're vast. I mean, working at night, you can't, I mean, it's pitch black. You can't see your hand in front of your face. Uh, you can hear hyenas in the background. You're hoping lions aren't kind of stalking you, hoping that, or thinking that's your dinner. So these guys are amazing. They actually don't get paid to go out on uh, ambush missions at night. They're, they work from 6 to 4.30 during the day, and just out of pure passion and drive, they go out every night to go try and arrest poachers. I mean, as you can see, just working at night and trying to arrest people that are armed, that are most likely tr going to try and hurt you if you, <coughs> if you come in contact with them. I mean, it's, so these are the codes that they wear. it's extremely Timer. dangerous. Timer. Timer. So these jackets, they'll actually cover themselves in animal blood so they don't give away uh, or scare the animals away um, from their scent. So we actually had uh, a vehicle with a long-range uh, thermal camera mounted on top of it on a pan tilt mount, and they were on a hillside acting as the, the long-range eyes in the sky, or like, kind of like a, a drone would be. And we went out uh, in other vehicles and kind of set up on, in, on flanks, and the, the ranger with the thermal camera spotted a group of eight poachers, so he talked us on. I mean, this is after we sprung the ambush. We, we would be driving in pitch black, and he, the ranger with the thermal camera would act as our eyes, and he was telling the guys over the radio, left, left, right, right, and he was basically driving for them. Uh, 
So actually, before the thermal camera, and when we first delivered the system uh, to the rangers, they were kind of hesitant on how the, they would use the technology, and they kind of didn't uh, or didn't click, and they were uh, they had their doubts, and they just saw it as another task that I mean they'd be saturated with. But as soon as we showed them the capability, it instantly clicked, and now they they feel blind. They will not go out at night without a, the thermal camera because they just see. I mean the. I mean, how it's improved their effectiveness and efficiency. So, I mean, you can imagine working at night with just a flashlight, and now all of a sudden you have this machine that can see, I mean, for, for miles. I mean, at night, it just covers a, a vast area. And now, before they would, again, sit and wait and listen, and hope poachers would walk up on them, but now they can actually, or go out and actively search for the, the poachers. And they're arresting people that they would have never arrested without the thermal camera. So again, after looking at all the technologies uh, that existed or that were off the shelf, trying to find things that would work in Africa, uh, we instantly realized that thermal imaging and night vision uh, would have the, huge, or the, the biggest impact out of the box. And where the poachers used to own the night and work freely, I mean, without being detected, now that, that game has, I mean, shifted and completely flipped. Now the rangers are using the night to their advantage because they are outfitted with thermal cameras. And we're extremely grateful now that FLIR has partnered with us on this project. And 2017 is going to be an exciting year for us, and we hope to catch every single poacher that tries to enter these places. So again, just to reflect on my comment earlier about Keratin being all rhino horn is, if you're ever interested in it, just go ahead and grind your fingernails or your toenails and snort it and save yourself thousands and thousands of dollars. <laughs>